Hey guys, welcome to the channel, as you see in the thumbnail what if, Deku become a emerald lighting hero part 2. Before I start, please do support for more awesome content, and subscribe my channel and like this video, and also share this video with your friends. I have created my other videos playlist, there you can watch my all videos easily, check out as well. Let's start this video. At 8am the students in UA take in their morning classes. Like normal schools, they take regular lessons as if it was no different than another high school. Some force themselves to pay attention, while the others either actually take notes due to genuine interest or daydream out of boredom. It's all the lot of them can do until lunch rolls around at 11, where they take in and enjoy the delicious meals cooked by the cooking hero lunch rush. I'm the hero of my own story. He says occasionally. Afterward, things really pick up in their attention span, for as soon as it hits the afternoon the actual hero training begins. In from the classroom door, a man steps in. Upon seeing his face, Izuku flinches when he recognizes this man's face. Additionally, Shinso seems reactive upon seeing him. This surprisingly thin person with yellow, spiky hair, and eyes that cannot be seen stands at the door moving inside. He grabs a piece of chalk as he stands by the chalkboard. Hello, young ones. My name is Valiant. That's he spells out his name in katakana on the board. Excuse me, asks Izuku with his hand raised, but, are you a hero? The man turns over to face Izuku, along with the rest of the class. He shrinks in his seat and turns red. I I was just wondering since I don't recognize your appearance. The class then turns to Valiant, who responds. I'm what you call a retired hero. From overseas. In America. Whoa, a retired hero from America, mutters Kirishima. Does that make him a Yankee? Asks Asui with a finger to her lips, her blatant question a showcase of how she performs. Valian clears his throat as he ignores the children's honest opinions, before speaking out what they really want to hear. No need to waste any more time on introductions, anyway, today is what you're all waiting for. This class will be everything you've been expecting in a hero course, hero training. We'll start with he checks a note in his back pocket. Battle training. The class rises in excitement, partially, at this piece of information. The clear standouts are Bakugo and Izuku, ready to show what they lacked in the quirk assessment test. First things first, you need to look the part. Valiant raises a remote with his hand from the other pocket, pressing a button. Four cabinets extend out from the left wall of the room, each cabinet containing five drawer openings, the top of the first cabinet starting at 1, going to the bottom of the last being 20. In accordance with your quirk registry and the special request forms you filled out before being admitted, your costumes have been created based on your designs. All 20 go up and grab their costume suitcases. Once you've all changed, head to ground beta and remember the school motto, plus ultra. He then makes his exit as everyone heads for the locker rooms to change. Izuku runs off with his suitcase giddy at what the support companies made for him. Over at ground beta, Valiant stands with his eyes on his watch in front of the entrance to the training grounds. Phew. No one caught on yet. After a few more minutes he looks over to see the students starting to come out. Ranging from Aoyama's flashy knight in armor, Iida's cool engine motif, and Kate, the bulky, and kind of sexy Kirishima, the definitely sexy Aoi Rozu, and even the more likely to become a villain Bakugo, their costumes all make them proper heroes in training. Nice, all of you, says Valiant as he examines his students. A part of him is proud at how heroic they all already look, knowing that in the future their outfits will become even more detailed and necessary for their heroics. They say clothes make the man, so it's good that you take care of your costumes. This is how the world will see you. As the rest of the class admire the other's costumes, Iida looks around checking if everyone's here. Who are we missing? Midoriya, says Shinso as he looks around. This costume is a purple bodysuit containing pads on the stomach and chest with blue stripes going up and down his collar to resemble teeth curled in a smile. He wears a strange muffler colored black and violet hanging from his neck with knee and elbow pads of the same style. His boots are an onyx type with his hands up to his elbows wrapped in bright blue gloves. All in all, the clothes show off his muscular frame underneath. Give him time. Deku won't be late, says Bakugo as he looks over. I'm here. The rest of the class look over to spot Izuku Midoriya coming in. The emerald protagonist is wearing an olive short-sleeved shirt that sports the same golden lightning bolt symbol on his chest with a blue collar. His pants are also green that stick close to his skin, over top cobalt shoes with black laces, unlike the red ones he wore to class with a golden utility belt. Over this, he wears a dark blue overcoat with yellow lining on the cuffs and along with the zippers and dark blue shades hanging from a bungee cord along his neck. Strapped to his back is a Sinebar helted katana in its scabbard. Oh, Deku! Shouts Yuraka as she approaches Izuku, a bounce in her step. So cool. You're like a ninja. 
Unfortunately, seeing his pink classmate that isn't Ashido in her costume sets off a feeling in him that causes the boy to hide his face. He coughs to correct his stutter and says, thanks. That was the basis of my costume design. It was either this or something entirely metal and mom was against it for some reason. He then tries to face her, asking, what about your costume? All right, this, she mutters, embarrassed at her costume's more revealing features. I should have been more specific with what I wanted and they gave me skin tights. It could be worse, Shinso speaks, having overheard their conversation, while pointing over to Yeoi Rozu coming over. You could look like that. Oh, this. Yeoi Rozu gestures to her costume. I know, it's embarrassing. I wanted something that exposed more skin, but regulations wouldn't let me. Here is where his nose cries crimson. Izuku can only regulate in his mind that Yeoi Rozu would have chosen something more revealing had she the chance. These girls are gonna give me a heart attack, and high blood pressure doesn't affect me. Mineta stares, before giving a thumbs up to no one. The hero course is awesome. Alright, is everyone here? Val asks, getting everyone to face him. Good. Now, today's training shall be based on combat. Why are we doing this type of exercise inside? Asks Asui curiously. What are we being graded on? Asks Iida. What is the criteria for success? This is Yaoi Rozu. Are we going to be expelled if we fail? States Uraraka. Then I blow them all away. This comes from Bakugo. Whoa, one at a time. I don't have super hearing. He holds his hand out to try and quell their responses before taking out that notepad. Anyway, the situation is this, two villains have stolen a nuclear device capable of destroying a city block and are held up in a building. Two heroes have to go in and steal the device back. By this type of exercise is done is to deliver two points across. I'm sure all of you are used to seeing villain attacks on your way home from school or while well just minding your own business and you expect that stopping villains would be as simple as we heroes make it look. He notes the class looking amongst themselves in agreement. Well not only is that not true, that is only half of the type of villains you'll come across. The most dangerous criminals are the smart ones, those who blend in the crowd outside of the viewing public and you're more likely to face them in a building than out on the streets. Izuku nods in agreement. Another point is, according to Izawa, to have you practice your abilities against your fellow students. In a confined environment, you will be knowingly using your quirks on people. Is he reading from a cheat sheet? Mutters Kirishima. Siro shakes his head in shame, whispering, he doesn't even know what he's saying, does he? Anyway, to follow up my explanation from before, the villain team will win by capturing the hero team or surviving with their bomb intact for 15 minutes. The hero team wins by either capturing both the villains or touching the bomb within that time limit. He holds out a roll of white tape. He will use this to capture the enemy by wrapping it around any part of their body. And now, he takes from behind him a box. Holding it in front of them, he speaks to draw lots. Inside are two sets of balls numbered 1 through 10. Each person will pick one, and the equal number will be your partner. As everyone goes to pick their balls from the box, Izuku notices the familiar way he shouts. The electric teen eventually goes to grab his number ball, which reads 1. Soon, Val announces the teams. Number 1, Midoriya, and Yuraka. These two look at each other with surprise, though she's happier while he's just shocked. Not that he isn't happy to be paired up with her. 2, Hagakur, and Ajiro. Hagakur goes over to Ajiro with a high five. 3, Shinso, and Jiro. The earphone girl sighs looking over at her equally purple partner. She sighs. 4, Tokoyami, and Asui. The birdman stares at the frog girl, who stares back as if trying to hypnotize him. She then smiles, taking him off guard. 5, Aoyama, and Ashido. Acid girl shrugs. 6, Todoroki, and Shouji. Shouji glances at the boy whose left half is covered entirely in ice. Why is his question? 7, Yeoi Rozu, and Mineta. The little one immediately gives a thumbs up, while the rich girl instantly starts requesting to change partners. 8, Bakugo, and Iida. The walking nuke groans. 9, Kirishima, and Siro. Kirishima gives her partner an elbow nod, causing Siro to blush. 10, Sato and Koda. These two already could tell and are instantly nervous. And here we come to battle lots. Val returns the balls back to their box. For the first match, the hero team will be he pulls out from the box the number three. Number three, Team Shinji. Shinji? Shinso looks over to Jiru. He then chuckles. Oh, I get it. It's not that funny, says the earphone girl, her eyes narrow as she stares at her weird partner. And for the villains, we have he dips his hand into the box again, pausing. He then pulls out the ball for the villain team. N-U-M-B-E-R-3. Wait, that ain't right. He tosses the ball aside and pulls out another one. Number one, Team Midara. Midara. Iraka jumps up with a smile. That's us. Great, now I'm a villain. 
I hope that doesn't last, says Izuku as he crosses his arms. It's just a part of the job, says his chestnut-haired friend as she pats his back. She ends up causing him to levitate as a result. Biwa. Oops. She presses her fingers together, cancelling her quirk out before he got too high. He lands with a plop. Ow, my butt. Shinso looks on with a studious look in his eyes as Bakugo laughs at his childhood friend. Midoriya, you're Raka, says Valiant as he approaches the villains, you two will go inside this building and set up. You have three minutes until start time. The heroes will be outside planning as well. Time elapses. Inside one of the buildings, Izuku and Yuraka stand together. The giant object next to them is the nuclear bomb they have to protect. As the Emerald protagonist goes over what he remembers from yesterday about what he saw from everyone else's quirk. Um. Yuraka comes over to Izuku, removing her helmet. Is something wrong? She asks. No, I'm just thinking about Shinso and Jiro's quirk and how they work, he tells her, while checking notes he wrote down. Jiro's quirk is related to sound and her earlobes. If she has good hearing she can find where we are just by listening and taking away our element of surprise. Shinso's quirk gives him boosts of strength and power. He'll be the main fighting force. The girl is visibly impressed. Wow, you really thought that through. Do you have notes on everyone? They're not that detailed. Just what I assume how their powers work. He holds up his notebook. You're in here too. I am? He's used to that reaction, people would freak out at the thought of him writing such detailed notes on others. Which is why I need to know a bit about your quirk that I don't know about in order to come up with a proper plan. Outside, Shinso and Jiro go through with their plan. After pacing back and forth, the girl turns to her amethyst rival and asks, why would we do that? It's a solid plan, he replies with a shrug. You've seen Midoriya during the test, his versatile quirk is the main threat to us. One zap and we're pinned to the wall. That's true, she nods in agreement, and your rocket just needs to touch us to make us float. Even if I went long range she can tap my jacks to put me on the ceiling. That's why we'll have to do things that way. Shinso then gives a smile before crossing his arms over his chest. Besides, I've been meaning to test these powers out on someone like him. Uh. Soon, time elapses for their planning. The heroes enter the building, entering through the hallways. Jiro puts her earphone jack to the wall and listens in on activities in the building. After a few seconds, she turns to Shinso, saying, I can hear a faint noise coming from upstairs, probably a pulse from someone's feet. But, it's only one pulse. Shinso cups his chin to think it over. Logically, it must be your Raka. If Izuku can magnetize items he can float on them, he's seen him do it to that ball, so he can do it to anything. Where do you hear it? Upstairs, third floor. We'll just have to make this fast. He cracks his knuckles as an amethyst spark of energy flows around his body. A powerful aura brims around him as a result. Let's go. He grabs Jiro's hand and runs forward to the nearest steps, pulling her along at a speed she couldn't possibly keep up with on her own. She screams as she gets dragged up the stairs by this purple jerk. Eventually, they reach the third floor, where the two stop just on top of the third floor step. Jiro with her hair frilly wobbles trying to keep her feet planted. Shinso looks back at her, patting her shoulder to keep her steady. Sorry about that. We just need to get up here as soon as possible. She gives him the look, sighing. You're gonna pay for that if we don't win. While he scratches his head sheepishly, the girl listens in for their targets. She points down the hall. Together, the two run down the hall with Shinso cancelling that quirk of his. The team reaches a room section far off from the rest of the hall. Jiro points to it, being cautious of what to do now. Though as they examine and get closer, they notice a green wall in front of it. She asks, what's that? The wall of electromagnetic energy to keep us out, Shinso replies before looking around. He whispers, we'll go around back. But, there's just another wall on that side. Exactly. It's a closed off room with only one exit. The two go around to get to the other side of the room the villains have hidden in. Coming down the hall, the hero team spots the wall they were looking for. Shinso summons that energy around him, his eyes focused on the task. He rushes forth with his right fist drawn back and smashes through to the other side busting down the wall. As the debris settles, Shinso sees Izuku inside the room on a knee with both hands to the floor. Achako is there as well, standing on a circular metal disc floating just centimeters off the ground next to Izuku. The bomb they sought to capture is settled behind Izuku blocked between him and the electromagnetic wall. The Emerald Child says, I gotcha. How so? Shinso prepares to step forward, struggling too. He checks down and groans. So this was your plan. Piero, not yet in the room, checks what has happened. As the magnetic wall behind him dissolves, the electric teen speaks. We figured with Shinso's strength you'd try to break in another way. So I'm magnetizing the floor by that wall so you guys can't get in. 
Snorting a chuckle, Shinso claps his hands. Not bad. You thought that through. Thanks, Izuku replies before he turns to his chestnut-haired partner. You're Raka, Jiro isn't caught, but she can't move without getting trapped. She won't try anything. Right. I'll make this quick. Your Raka takes out the capture tape. He raises a hand from the floor to guide his saucer over to Shinso. Said amethyst-haired teenager glares at the electric boy before turning his eyes to the gravity girl. A grin spreads from one corner in his mouth to the other. His energy spreads over to his arms. Shouldn't have done that, cause you forgot to lock out my arms. Jiro. He throws a punch down to the floor, smashing it to pieces. The fractures stop in a circle underneath him, Shinso falling down and breaking free of his hold. From behind him, Jiro becomes visible to Yuraka and Izuku, who bends at the knees injecting her earlobes into the speakers on her boots. Remembering what Jiro's quirk does, Yuraka turns to Izuku saying, Go up. Damn it. He raises his hand, just as she attacks. Heartbeat, fuzz. Jiro shouts, firing a sonic wave at Izuku. Upon getting hit, he grips his head holding his ears. This, unfortunately, cancels the magnetism on the saucer Yuraka stands on. Acting fast, Yuraka jumps off of the saucer making a dive for Jiro, knowing it's the only way to break him free. As she does, the floor where the original first exit was, the electromagnetic wall is gone now, shatters apart as someone breaks through from the floor below. This is Shinso, the aura of his quirk surrounding him completely. The moment Yuraka, having dropped onto Jiro and caught her since the latter girl is unable to move without releasing the incapacitated Izuku, captures the sound girl, Shinso grabs hold of the prop bomb. It's over. The hero team wins. Val's voice shouts on the loudspeaker. Izuku recovers from the attack that almost gave him tinnitus and quickly processes what happened. He broke down on the floor below to catch us off guard and distract me from Jiro. He looks down at the gaping hole in the floor and notes how high they are compared to the floor below. He managed to survive the fall and get back up in the few seconds it took for Jiro to stun me. Or did he use his strength to propel himself through the air? No, he'd need to have a level of strength comparable to All Might to do that. He drops down on a hand and a knee with a smirk of accepted defeat. They've beaten us in every way. Yuraka looks down at Jiro, holding a hand to her. She sheepishly apologizes, saying, no hard feelings. None, is her reply. Izuku looks back just in time to see the guy he lost to holding a hand down to him. Need help getting up, asks the brawler. Izuku sighs before taking his hand to help him stand. But the battle training for them over, Izuku, Yuraka, Shinso, and Jiro stand together before the rest of their class in a room underneath one of the buildings in the slot. Val gestures to Izuku, saying, the winner of this battle training was Yuraka. Hey! Almost everyone shouts this as they stare at Valiant. Many of them question why that is so when their team lost, even Izuku himself if only internally. Would anyone care to ask why? It's quite simple if you think about it, says Yeoyorozu as she raises her hand. Out of everyone here, she made the least amount of mistakes. Shinso was able to find another way in, but he broke through the wall and floor at full force. Had the bomb been there he could have damaged it, causing it to explode. In a real situation, you'd have to be more careful about that. Jiro made few mistakes as well, but she took only a support role in stalling Midoriya. Speaking of whom, he didn't act in time and failed to come up with a backup plan in case the first plan failed. Yuraka, meanwhile, managed to act fast and save her teammate by attacking the one stalling him. Had she been faster, they could have still pulled it around. Surprised by his friend's extremely precise analysis, he looks over at Yeoirozu with awe. She is definitely smarter than he is. Why yes, that's everything, Valiant says, surprised by her detailed essay of a response. Wow, Yuraka says with a blush, not used to this type of praise. Hey, congratulations, Izuku says as he pats her back. Guess I have a lot to learn from you. As she bashes further, Valiant glances an eye over to Shinso. He won without resorting to that, and he didn't break any limbs either. So proud of you, Hitashi, a feeling I've never lost since I met you eight years ago. Well, with that over with, it's time to continue on with the next match. Valiant holds up the box, places it in front of himself, and then digs in. From it, he pulls number one and sighs with utter annoyance at this gag. It's gonna be like this all day, isn't it? He tosses the one ball away and grabs another. The heroes will be six, Team Todoshu. Their villain team is eight, Team Bakui. Is he just going to keep doing that, mutters Bakugo with annoyance. You know the rules, the villain team enters first to set up and each team has three minutes to prepare. Once the timer begins, Bakugo rushes out of the room the bombs held up in. He reaches a hall leading to the stairs and remains there. Four eyes is all that's needed to protect that thing. I'll stay here and take them by surprise as soon as they arrive. My explosions are strong enough to take out that ice and multi-limb is just muscles. 
Unfortunately, what he failed to take into account was how fast the ice is. For as soon as he gets comfortable, the entirety of the building is soon encased in a frozen landscape. This includes himself, his legs frozen in place unable to break free. What the hell? The flabbergasted boy can only watch in vain as he hears someone stepping inside and climbs the steps. Up steps Todoroki in his hero costume, walking past him. Bakugo glares angrily as he walks by, completely ignored. Damn you damn you. Over with the rest of the students, they can only watch in shock, as Todoroki effortlessly won the training all by himself. Shouji just stood there as he turned the building into a popsicle. So manly, says Kirishima, her eyes batting in awe at Todoroki's brute power. I don't get it, says Yuraka in shock as she stares at the screen showing them everything. Why doesn't Bakugo just blow the ice away? That's what he's good at. Because he can't, Izuku answers, sighing. Kakin's quirk turns his sweat into nitroglycerin that he can use his hands to detonate with. No sweat, no explosions. He places a hand to his face. This was his worst matchup. Boo, scary, jokes Shinso with a frown. Whether it's from his skill or the chill, he shivers without will. The class then watches as Todoroki takes hold of the bomb with his left hand. An intense wave of heat emits from that arm, melting all the ice within and without. Seeing it, Izuku pieces together what the left side does. The right makes ice, and the left is fire. Heh, he's like a dragon, Shinso states, getting what Izuku was talking about. Soon all the matches proceed as expected, some faster than others, except for that second match. Valiant stands before his class staring at them all. I hope you all enjoyed that. In the end, no one received major injuries, and I hope you all learned a thing or two about yourselves and each other. It was a little too straightforward, says the female retreat. Which is fine, considering our last thing. After Izawa sensei almost expelling one of us, begins Asui, a straightforward class is pretty unsatisfying. Do you want us to be expelled? Shouji questions her. We teachers are allowed to teach the way we wish, is his main response, Val slightly sweating at that denouncing statement from the frog girl. Now I'm off. You all change out of those costumes and return to the classroom. With that in their minds, Valiant walks away with a stretch in his arms. Nothing else left to do, the group make their way back inside to change out. As they do, Yeoi Rozu approaches Izuku and asks, how was my analysis? Pre he looks away from her, his head turning into a tomato. Pretty accurate. Thank you, she says with a smile, although it's curious why you never used your weapon. Oh, that's something I can't use yet, he tells her. Elsewhere, Valiant enters the school building with a sigh. Yeesh. I gotta do this tomorrow with class 1B. He checks his phone, before glancing over where the students he left went. Well, at least he's doing well. After all the students change out of their costumes, they all situate themselves in their homeroom class. With no more classes left, the 20 pre-adults leave for home, once the time is right for them. The first to leave, Izuku follows after Bakugo, who has already left in a hurry. Yo, Kaken. Back off, Deku, he barks, moving faster to avoid his electric childhood friend. I'm too pissed right now. I know, Izuku nods to the side agreeing with him. You lost so easily. I said back off, he shouts, before immediately coughing. He drops down to his knees and hacks up something yellow. Roast out, Izuku says, it's okay though, I lost too, so I know how you feel. I lost because I literally could do nothing. My sweat froze before I could detonate it. The blonde tightens his hold on his anger as he shivers, his body unable to stay still. I was completely helpless. Remembering the entire event, Izuku sighs as he realizes just how similar this was to that moment, if only by a margin. What exactly could he do to help such a prideful person? Hakan? No, don't. His scarlet eyes focus onto those olive ones, the former pair turning watery. I told you a time ago that I would be the greatest soul hero, and for the longest time I've always seen you as the one person I would have to one day surpass. Do you know how humiliating it is to find out how far away that dream is? How stupid I feel for boasting how strong and overpowered I'm supposed to be to those extras back in middle school. I feel just as useless as I was when that slime bastard caught me. Izuku would lie if he didn't pity Bakugo right now, if he said he never felt sorry for him. But he doesn't need that. If that's how you feel, then just get stronger. The explosive rival glares at him, calming down. I'm going to get stronger too, so I don't end up losing like that again either. If you don't want me to pity you, don't let that loss get to you. His eyes narrow into a dark and hateful rage before he gains a half-strong grin. You bitch you think I'm going to lie down and cry like a big gay baby. I'm not giving up on my dream. To be the strongest, solitary hero every. Just like All Might. So wait for my progress, bitch. He wipes his face and storms away, grumbling under his breath. 
Izuku watches as his friend rival Bully leaves the school premise, sighing as he thinks just how Bakugo functions. If he can learn to work with others, there's no telling where he can go. But being a solitary hero that slime villain really scarred him. Though before Izuku could leave for home, he remembers Shinso and how he was outclassed by him. He could hold him in his tracks, but he's far faster than he can predict, not to mention he's pretty smart to come up with that plan to capture the bomb. It was clearly to keep him busy and get an opening. How would they fare against each other one-on-one? -on -one? Over in a section of Honshu far from Tokyo, a man can be found in the main building of the company Detnerid. Looking out the window he sits at his desk, reading a newspaper with a content smile on his face. This pointy-nosed man scans over this aged article from 17 years ago. He places a finger to the photo on the page and slides it down, almost infatuated with this armored person and the destruction posted in that picture. He then turns the page whistling whimsically. Sir, we're back. The man turns around in his chair and glances at two associates who have entered his offer. Did you find him? We found a clue. UA High School. Then you know what to do. The following day, the students of UA can be found heading into class. For the class of 1A, most of them are already inside, with the rest following shortly before the bell could ring. It's a good thing too, as soon as their homeroom teacher enters, everyone quickly silences their mouths and their cell phones. Their unkempt teacher checks his watch and nods. 8 seconds. Much better. Azawa steps before his desk, saying, good morning. I gotta look at everyone's score, and I have to say I'm pretty impressed with all of you. He then glances over at the group. But first, Bakugo. The boy with topaz hair glares at his desk, but still listens nonetheless. Do not be afraid to fail. That's what this is for. He then adjusts himself, glaring at the whole of the class intensely. Alright, now today is time for something more concerning. Sorry for the sudden announcement, but since it's apparently important, everyone goes tense with anticipation for a pop quiz. Today, you'll pick a classroom president. The class eagerly shouts with joy at such a mundane school thing taking place. Soon the class goes into an uproar as many want to be the class president and are offering reasons, sparring sessions, class trips, and miniskirt Fridays are just some of the options thrown out there. Everyone, calm yourselves, shouts Ida, getting everyone's attention. It is the duty of the president of each class to lead and be there for all 19 others of their class. Only someone who can earn the trust of those around them can be fit to lead, which is why I suggest everyone votes for their representatives. Bakugo notes his arm raised as high as possible. How about putting your hand down first, you hypocrite? Asui speaks her mind now, saying, how can we vote for anyone? We've only known each other for two days, so we don't really trust anyone. That's why I suggested we vote. Surely, the one with the most votes will have earned enough trust to lead. But we're all just gonna vote for ourselves, says Kirishima with a hand held out holding her argument. I don't care, just hurry it up, as always states this, before slipping into his sleeping bag. Eventually, the students vote for their chosen leader on slips of paper. The scores tally up on the electronic part of the board, showing every name everyone voted for. The highest two are Shinso at three, with Yayoi Rozu at two. Oh, damn it, mutters the winner. Oh, dang it, mutters the runner-up. Oh well, mutters the electric team. Not a single vote groans Ieda as he stews in his seat. Well, there you have it, your class president is Shinso, and his vice is Yayoi Rozu. Okay, that brings this chapter to an end. Next time we post, we'll be that's dependent. The next chapter won't be what you expected. You say. Isn't it USJ? K. Dart's eyes left to right rapidly I can honestly say without lying that the next three chapters will be featured in the unforeseen simulation joint. You say. Is it the League of Villain? Itashi Shinso makes an unpleasant groan. Here in the mess hall of UA High, the purple lightning bruiser walks in by his lonesome with his arms behind his head. From his position, he notes a large amount of the students he's been paired with already waiting in line for food. Thinking about his position, he gives out a depressing sigh. While the position of Class 1A's president is flattering, he's not exactly suited for leading others. His heart is honestly more suited for leading by example, not by direction. With all the training he's gained with his superpower quirk, he needs to focus on improving the usage of that power. During battle training, the maximum I used was 19%. That alone won't be enough to defeat Midoriya, or a real villain in a real fight. Instead of wasting time giving positions and planning school trips, I gotta get stronger. For Toshinori. He stares at his classmates before joining the line for Don Buri, jumping in behind Izuku and Yayoi Rozu. Once there, he notices the two chewing the fat. So, congrats on becoming a vice president Yayoi Rozu. It's fine, I guess. I kind of wanted a higher position. Shinso watches as the two collect their meals and take a seat at a table. 
The purple-haired teenager orders his own meal, Mapo Dufu, and follows after with his own plan running in his mind, having noticed the table consists already of them, Yuraka, Iida, and strangely Bakugu. Hey, Shinso, says Izuku, calling out to him with a wave, and taking him by surprise. HM? You want to join us? Yeah, come sit down, Mr. President, speaks Yuraka with her exuberant energy. Shrugging, he takes a seat at the open spot next to his vice. Thinking about it, Momo Yeoi Rozu, by all means, would be a far better choice to being the leader of this class of misfits than him. Out of everyone, she was able to in meticulous detail describe the winners of everyone's battle training. Sure, that power of his draws people in, but he by himself isn't charismatic. Hell, if he didn't get this lucky he'd be no one. Though if he picked her, that'd still leave him in a position where he has to deal with the role of a vice president. With his authority he could pick anyone, but who is worthy of lifting this hammer? How does being president feel, Shinso? Asks Iida after he chews his noodles. Okay, I guess, Shinso says with a shrug before he proceeds to chew what ends up in his spoon. I'm not used to leading. Who is? Izuku states jokingly. Iida waves his hand up. I know you'll do fine, he speaks, my vote won't go to waste with someone as qualified as you. Shinso almost chokes on his meal. You voted for me. You're a collected, level-headed person with an impressive quirk. Your ability to assess and overcome Midoriya during the trial is proof. That's true he admits, noticing Izuku looking off to the side with an embarrassed expression. But Iida, begins Yuraka, didn't you want the title more than anyone? I mean, you got glasses. As the rest of the table looks amiss at her bluntness, Iida waves her off in a robotic manner. Just because you want it doesn't mean you deserve it. Such a title should go to those most deserving, most fitting. So why did you vote for me, is what Shinso is thinking at the moment. Turning over to Izuku, a particular thought reaches the forefront of his head. Hmm, he muses as he plots this out through his skull, while watching him eat that tonkatsu. He nods agreeing with his plan. Later that day, the students find themselves in their classrooms. As Awa enters the classroom, a light smirk rising on his face the moment he realizes they all quieted down soon as he entered. Good to know you're all learning well. Sensei. Too late. Iida raises his hand to speak. Isn't this the part where we enter hero training? Not today, is his reply. Like class 1B yesterday since there's only one sponsor for this training, you'll be allowed to leave earlier since there's nothing left to do. He then chuckles, or rather sighs. It sounds like both. Or, that's what would have happened. But since you all missed orientation you have to take your guidance sessions. The consensus this time is in a complaint on how that's also his fault. Azawa places a sheet of paper on his desk. Since this is a waste of time for me, I'll let your class representatives handle this. I'll see you lot tomorrow. Shinso groans while the teacher leaves the room, forcing him and Yeoi Rozu to rise and approach the podium. The president picks up the sheet and looks over the activities he has to do as said president. But before that, it lists the room they have to go for their guidance sessions. Alright, when I call your name, you'll all file to the room I tell you to at a time. There are two counselors thankfully. When you're done, you come back and let us know you did it. Wouldn't it be more prudent for you to walk us there to make sure we go? Asks Izuku. Oh, you'll go. Shinso grins shaking his head. I'm pretty sure, if you don't Mr. Scary Homeroom Teacher will stare at you until there's a hole in your head. Not if he doesn't care. This is from Jiro, as sarcastic as the other purple-haired person. Midoriya has the right idea. It'll show that we're taking this seriously, states Yeoi Rozu with a smile. Damn it. He then glances at Izuku. But, this does confirm my choice. But the directions given, the students soon start to file out to their destination. The list runs down until reaching Shinso and Izuku. The two move forward down the hall heading to a room to meet with their class's counselor. Here we are, room A7. Izuku walks up to the door, also huge like the rest, and gives a knock. Come in, Midoriya. The electric teen opens the door and steps inside, where he finds a carpeted floor with a living room set up. Inside he finds a man with frilly and free cyan hair sitting in a rotating chair. He wears an indigo suit with a blue shirt. The moment Izuku steps on the floor, he says, take off your shoes. Hey? I'd rather you not track dirt in here. Looking down, Izuku sighs before untying his red sneakers using his quirk. He then slips them off and steps onto the carpet, sitting on the couch. Looking around, Izuku is a bit confused by what he sees. Um, he begins, why is this room so much different than the rest of the school? Because why not? Is the adult's reply. This is much more relaxing, isn't it? Good point. He has to admit he's right, this is a nice break from the classroom setting. Also, are you a hero? Actually, no, he waves his gloved hand aside in the air. I did once upon a time work in All Might's agency, but that's it. Ah. Izuku nods to that. That would be enough. So. Shimura. 
Shimura-san, what exactly do I do here? He shifts in his seat to get more comfortable. As the school's counselor, it's my job to determine your mental state and guide you into becoming the ideal hero you wish to be. The man tents his fingers looking forward at Izuku as he sits back in his chair. The boy nods. Well, where would I begin? I feel the first, to start with is why you want to be a hero. Izuku leans his head up as that question wraps around his head. Why did he want to be a hero? I mean, do I really need such a deep reason? Well, Shimura shrugs, it's not like you need a depressing childhood or someone important dying in your family to be a hero. But, there are many job choices out there. Why be a hero? Izuku crosses his arms. To answer a question properly means going back to why he first inspired to become a hero. The answer? Well, I guess it all started with this nightmare is this. This is confidential. Phew. He wipes away the imaginary sweat and proceeds. As he begins, his expression drops down to a less positive one. Well, when I was two, I had this horrible dream. Outside. Shinso leans against the wall, his eyes buried into his phone. It's been a few minutes since Izuku went inside the room. Not that he forlorn having a session, he'd rather get back to what he needs to do. Plus, it'd be nice to have a quiet chat with Shimura again, an update if you will. The door eventually opens, and out steps the Emerald protagonist walking out. He notes his expression is far more pleased and content than before, which is saying something considering how straightforward and positive this boy is at least that's how he believes from their extended interaction. Shinso asks, how was it? I feel a lot better about something now, is his reply, his joyous tone expressed in his words. Your turn, Shinso. Great. Shinso steps inside the room, the door closing up quickly. Welcome, Hitashi. Shoes. WH really? He removes his shoes and steps on the carpet, sitting on the couch. You know, when you said you'd be working as a guidance counselor at a hero school, you never told me it was here. I figured it'd be a surprise. Shimura swaps to another paper on his clipboard. How has your training been? I'm up to 15%, but I can go at least 19 without breaking something, which was enough to win the battle training. And? I don't get how he did it so fast. I can barely have enough time to focus on my training, and that's before I became my class president. Well, you know what they say, plus ultra. The amethyst-haired teen sterns a snicker that soon blooms into a flowery chuckle. Or as I would retort, surpass the suck. This is where Shinso's mouth yanks open as he laughs. Yup. I can imagine how long he had to deal with surpassing the suck. The two then share in their laughter, one that they soon calm down from. Shimura then follows up with, any regrets? Of course not. If it weren't for him, I'd probably never be in this room. I'd just be the boy most likely destined to be a villain. He shakes his head as memories of that time return to him. Although, since we're talking about him, I did see him. He's actually being professional about us, no mention or hint of our connection at all, or even who he is. Thank God for that, Valiant. Shimura glances back down at his paper. But, back on track, I would ask why you want to become a hero, but we both know that. Right. Shinso's eyes downcast. That smile remains painted, unfazed by the chance of bad weather his eyes are predicting. I want to be a hero for two reasons. The first is to show that anyone with the heart to help others can be a hero if they work for it, no matter what people say about you or your quirk. And the other. To make it up to you for what you did. His crimson eyes narrow as he smiles. I probably shouldn't say this, but you shouldn't do it for me. Some time goes by as the two talk things over. The green-haired teen remains standing outside, writing in a notebook he pulls out of his back pocket. Instead of writing about his classmates' powers, because he's had all yesterday for such an endeavor, he writes down notes on himself specifically, alternative ways to utilize his quirk combat-wise. On his page, he has a drawing of himself flicking his finger and shooting a beam propelled by his finger. He writes, to perform such a feat requires a current on both sides of my arm, as well as something to survive the charge, metal. But if I use too much electricity it'll melt what I'm shooting, and too little will lower its speed, and it'll need to be something I can carry with ease. Maybe I know, that it'd be wasting money. The door soon opens, and out steps Shinso tying his shoes. Izuku quickly pockets his notes, and asks, how was it? Very informative. The guy's pedantic. Together, the two walk back to class. Soon, the rest of the class finishes their assignment. With the class president and his vice of class 1 of being the last to go, Shinso finds himself exiting the school at a time where the sky is now orange. But instead of being in his uniform, he's dressed in the blue and white gym clothes and yellow sneakers. He heads around back to the area they once did their assessment test. The superpowered quirk user approaches the track, his head flinching back when he spots someone else already there. Huh. Mineta is running across the track as fast as he could, head back, and chest up as his running position. 
Shinso watches as the sweaty grape slowly runs by him. He continues to beat feet until stopping and falling face forward. As he gets up, the class president examines him a bit further, he's far more battered and bruised than one should be by simply running. Whatever happened to him, he did more than simply sprinting across a track. Bizuku moves over quickly to the minuscule grape boy. Hey, are you okay? Mineta groans as he tries to get up. Just tired. Sighing, Izuku helps the boy onto his two feet. He asks, Mineta, why are you out here so late? We have training in heroics tomorrow. Mineta drops down with his hands to his knees, glaring at Izuku. Hey, you superpowers may be able to take it easy, but I'm one slip up away from failing. The two look at each other. You are. Don't you remember what is always said after that test? Izuku and Shinso pound their fists into their palms when they remember that one offline. Shinso then sighs patting Mineta's head. Look, it's fine. I'm pretty sure he wasn't serious about flunking us and this early in the semester. The little one's teeth gnarl against each other as he glares at him. I was joking when I said that earlier. What kind of school allows its teachers to fail students for getting in last? Oh yeah Mineta digs into his pocket and pulls out his phone, showing words. These are reviews of UA teachers from last year, and here you can find 20 with the same reply. The two look at the screen, squinting. Ah, I can't read this. Hold on. Izuku takes the phone and inputs his electricity into the smart device. The screen is shown stretching out like a hologram. The other two turn to Izuku with shock. Mineta looks at his phone and then him. You can do that. Yeah, uh, is his quick reply, as if nothing was out of the ordinary. Shrugging it off, they turn their eyes to the screen to view the many reviews left by parents for the teachers of UA, most especially Shota's Awaaka Racerhead. When they see his hero name Izuku immediately goes, oh, when he recalls who that hero is. FK that guy. How dare he expel my son just because he didn't try as hard as possible. He got first place. He'd be nothing without that quirk of his. My little Ira would squash him. He does not believe in second chances. How can he judge my child a failure when he carries his bed to the bathroom? That last one has a point, Shinso chuckles. You see if I slack even a little I'll get kicked out. I'll be as bitter and lonely as the people in these comments. Says Mineta as he pulls his phone away, cancelling the projection Izuku made. I'll never have my harem. Sighing at that, Izuku takes a knee and says, come on, Mineta. The fact that you're still here means he sees potential in you. Just think of why you became a hero in the first place and use that to motivate you. That stupid guidance counselor told me to find something less creepy. There is a beat. Creepy. I want girls to touch me. At that, both heads of the taller gentleman drop. I figured girls would be more open to being with a guy like me if I was a hero because women love cool guys. And what's cooler than a hero? Shinso groans before pulling his hand away. Look, you oh crap. One of the pop-off balls is stuck to his hand. How long does this last? Depends on my diet. As he uses his quirk to smash and explode the ball, causing grape slime to splash all over him, Izuku speaks. Mineta, I don't exactly know what girls want, but I doubt simply being cool and strong is enough. Hakan was one of the most standout guys in my class and none of the girls asked him out. Mm, shocker, mutters Shinso. He then puts in his two cents. Azawa has a point, we're going to be in this school for three years, so we're better off focusing on becoming heroes than dating. Get stronger and better than everyone else, and the girls will follow. Really? Well, he pokes his stomach, not perving on them would be a plus. Oh, sure, when I do it I'm a creep. It's at this point tears start to form. If I was a pretty girl I bet no one would be angry at me. The two shudder at the thought of that, a female Mineta drooling over them. After recovery, Izuku adds, Mineta, I want you to succeed. I want everyone in our class to succeed, even Kaken. If you're serious about your training, I'll help you out every step of the way. Here the tears dry up. Mineta looks up at Izuku, asking, do you mean it? Yup. Such a bright smile reflects off the boy, blinding both the minuscule violet boy and Shinso effectively. So bright. Tomorrow. Shinso opens the door to his home, stepping out with a kick in his step. From behind him, his mom says, Hitashi, good luck at school. Thanks. He heads out moving fast. While walking to the train, he passes by other kids his age on their way to school. Looking back, he notices that a slew of them still have their eyes on him, eyes that look none too friendly. He can even hear their murmurings. So, he got into you, eh? Lucky bastard. Must be great to have a top quirk that lets you be what you want to be. Shinso looks back, and they immediately turn away as if pretending they never spoke those words. Though, he feels rather sympathetic. There was a time after all where he felt that way. It brings a depressing scowl to him, where he sighs. If I never met him, would I be like that? The bitter and jealous person always complaining about every hero course kid's quirk. 
Once he reaches school and enters his class, he finds a good deal of the others already there waiting for him. Izuku can be found in his seat talking to Yayoi Rozu. Hmm, they get along pretty well. Soon the rest come in just before Izawa does, and he gives his morning greeting. Five seconds. Alright, perfect. He then says, so, today your hero training will be to improve your combat abilities. There's a special training session coming up next week, and this will be to prepare you for it, and now, your representatives will speak. Shinso and Yeoi Rozu get up and stand before the rest of the class. Shinso looks out to the rest of the class as he speaks, morning guys and girls. Before we start the announcements, for my first act as class president, I want to pass over my position. Their attention already focused on him, the students look among themselves before back at Shinso. The female Redeed asks, are you really giving it up? Of course, he shrugs, I mean, I honestly would rather Midoriya over there take over. Izuku's wild hair goes static at the announcement. A. Hey. Midoriya. Yeoi Rozu looks to Shinso. Midoriya waves his hands, his face turning red. Wait, I can't just accept this. You've earned that title. Yeah, but the thing is, I don't really want that. I can't focus on what I need to do if I'm busy looking after you guys. Yeoi Rozu narrows her brows, and eyelids staring at him. Then, why did you accept it in the first place? He responds with a stare of his own. It's not like I had a choice. If I'm the only one who's qualified then I'd have no choice but to accept. Because if I had the opportunity to dump this on someone else I'd pick someone best suited to lead. He wags his fingers now. And if you've been paying attention, I'm not exactly leadership material. So just take it. But, is that allowed? Izuku turns to Izawa. I don't care. Finish up, says the teacher. He takes a juice box and sips. Okay, I guess. Thanks. With a sense of pride in him, Izuku comes up to the stand, while the rest of the class clap in congratulations. Yes, even Bakugo is doing a non-sarcastic one, albeit low on energy. Hiroshima smiles while she says, well if that's what the president finds best. Midori is reliable actually, Mineta states with a nod. That could better be. Izuku gets up and approaches the front of the school as Bakugo says this. Still, why didn't you offer it to Yeoi Rozu? Izuku asks, noticing the gloomy expression on his richer friend glaring at himself and Shinso. She enjoys the duties this job gives. But then I'd be a vice. Nothing would change. Beoi Rozu lowers her eyebrows and heads with a gloomy expression. Nice of you to think of me. But do you want to be the class president? Not like this, she replies. Ahem. The loud throat clearing of the hero stops all activities of the heroes in training before him. As you were. All right. With his new authority, the green teen turns around to face his classmates. So, with this announcement line, Aoi Rozu sighs shaking her head, but smiles. Well, Shinso and I have several positions filled for people. Mr. President. She hands over a slip of paper to the president. While nervous, he receives the paper and looks it over. Also, after school, we'll be meeting with Class 1B about a project happening next week. Thanks for telling me. I can't wait to meet them. Our Emerald Protagonist says this with his notebook wide open. Where did that book come from? Moreover, enjoy do the thoughts of Midori around Shinso wonders under the healthiness of freedom in his mind. Seeing the excitement that his new position has granted, he has a feeling Izuku will enjoy this. 3 o'clock over at UA High, while a large group of students is going off for their homes, Momo Yaoi Rozu has different plans. Here, the Vice President of Class 1A and the boy who is her superior discover the other two from Class 1B inside a room waiting for them. The two take their seat, getting a good look at their comparisons. First is the girl with orange hair wrapped up on the left side of her head to generate a ponytail. She possesses teal eyes that reflect kindness and a colorful face with a smile that's far more inviting than one would expect. The person next to this student with spasartite garnet hair is also a girl with lush green hair that reaches down to her shoulders that is more akin to a forest than Izuku's bush. Thank you for calling this meeting, speaks the girl with the ponytail on the side. It'd be nice to finally meet our rivals. Heads tilt. Just kidding. I'm not that shallow. Aoi Rozu sighs at a response before speaking, right, of course. I'm Itsuka Kendo. Momo Aoi Rozu. The two girls bow to each other. The green girl glances over at Izuku, who stiffens up at her intense serpentine stare and reptilian grin. She extends a hand to him. The name's Itsuna Tokij, and you? Makumo Dang, it. He takes in a breath to regain control of his senses, before reaching his hand out to grasp and shake hers. Izuku Midoriya. Mid-shake, her hand pops right off. Eyes on it, the screaming soon commences after a quick beat. First is Izuku. Ah. Then comes Tokage. Kaya. Aoi Rozu jumps out of her seat, taken back by the reality before her. Kendo simply places a hand to her face and rests her head as Tokage continues. 
How could you? My hand. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to as he apologizes, her hand breaks free and floats in the air. It gives a wave. Just kidding. Her arm reattaches back in place as if nothing happened to it at all. Sorry about that, you were just so nervous, I needed to break the ice. Aoi Rozu places a hand to her mouth with shame, mostly in herself. She should have known that was a part of her quirk. It's embarrassing to think about now. Boizuku eyes her arm, that face of intrigue and discovery erupting full force. So your quirk allows you to remove your body parts. Is it just limbs, or can your entire body split apart? How far can they fly? You really shouldn't ask a woman about splitting. Perplexity on his face denotes that he completely missed what she was getting at. Still, she grins as she speaks, at that, it's impressive that you're so interested in my quirk. It's a hobby of mine, quirk cataloging, he tells her, a pen and notepad pulled out from behind his back. I see a quirk I've never seen before, I just can't help but want to know all about it. Its strengths, its weaknesses, how it can be used against another quirk, all of that. Oh? So then, you must have a lot of notes on what you've already seen. Tons. As the two Viridian teenagers talk, the other two remain watching them in steep confusion. The ruby vice president sighs, noticing he's already gotten over his earlier nervousness from the lizard girl's icebreaker. Now they're giving them the cold shoulder, which is not cool. Ahem. Fake throat clearing stops them from continuing their talk, causing the two to face the other two. Now a tomato head, Izuku takes his seat and puts away his notes. Satsuna sits down as well, parallel to him, and Kendo, though she leans back in her chair on two legs. Following him patting his face, Izuku turns to his cohort and says, sorry about that. She in turn smirks before speaking her mind. Anyway, now that introductions are out of the way, we can now get to the main topic of this meeting. Midoriya. Right. Izuku takes out a second notepad. After looking into the duties listed for the class representatives, we saw an opportunity to better our training growth. Due to UA's freestyle way of teaching, we also have some leeway in altering the training schedule. That is why we wanted to ask if you two would prefer this idea we have to share. Endo leans in with intense listening. Uh huh, and that is. There's a major training event that follows after the rescue training coming up this Wednesday, Yeoi Rozu says, following up after her president, which is entertainment lessons. Oh yeah, I've heard of that, says Itsuna, rocking back and forth in her seat. Vlad King told us about it. As it goes, there are three types of heroes, combat heroes who specialize in fighting crime, rescue heroes who partake in stopping or preventing disasters, and end-term heroes who use their appeal to support society in certain ways. Aoi Rozu nods. Our teacher doesn't plan on having us do this training, but we feel like it could be important for us, so we had an idea that could benefit both of us, we participate in the training together. Heads rise at the suggestion. Kendo turns to her partner and back before asking, as in both of our classes together, of course. Izuku speaks exuberantly here. The teacher said it was pointless to him, but he doesn't mind if we piggyback off another class. And this sounds like fun. What do you think, Madam President? Satsuna turns to Kendo, who remains deep in thought. Well, the competition could inspire us to do better Kendo muses out loud with a smile. It'd also help stop everyone from hating on class 1 unreasonably. You said everyone, but you mean Monoma, her vice replies, and he only hates one person from 1A. Then it settled. It settled. Classes 1B and 1 are going to compete in the entertainment lessons. She turns over to Satsuna, who gives back a nod. Oh, also, we were hoping to have something else. Something else. After a quick look to one another, the two from one face their B counterparts with a male president asking, what did you have in mind? I'd prefer it if we could meet together like this more often. Maybe off campus if possible, she tells him. Off campus, he repeats. Hendo raises a finger. I've done a little looking into, and it turns out that for the last 10 years of UA High's history, not a single class of the hero course met up with another. Well, except for last year. Yeah, Izuku says with a nod, I believe that, considering an entire class got expelled last year. That catches Yeoi Rozu's attention. Wait, expelled. Oh, you didn't know. Kendo goes on now. There was a teacher that kicked out an entire class of hero core students for failing an assessment test. Now our predecessors are numbered 19. Three heads turn to the spasartite haired president in shock. 19. Only 19. One of the students left halfway through the semester. She sighs. I couldn't find out anything more with a shrug, class 1B's representative extends a hand out to Yeoi Rozu. But, with all said, I guess we can finish this up. A pleasure to do business with you, Miss President. Oh, I'm the vice. Midori is the president, she replies, gesturing half-heartedly to the boy next to her. Oh. Sorry. Kendo corrects herself precariously before holding a hand out to Izuku. 
It's not gonna scare me by melting, right? Sitsuna laughs. After their handshake, Izuku pulls away the moment he notices green sparks forming from the brush up their hands have done. Thanks for having this go over so well. Oh, not a problem. I think it's nice that two from our class can connect like this. Yeah, says Itsuna loudly. I was half expecting this to turn into a disaster. In a rather ironic twist, Yayoi Rozu does agree. Having Midoriya instead of Shinso as her partner is a better experience, the former's nerdy intrigue is far better than the latter's righteous sarcasm. It's almost cute, but that's not important. As the students get up to leave, Satsuna grins as she adjusts her school bag and takes out a piece of Kobe beef. I guess you class made the right choice. Aoi Rozu nods with pride. Well, you can't go wrong with a student who got in on recommendations. Oh ho. Yeoi Rozu turns to the reptilian girl as she brags. She turns bubbly before saying, I'm also a recommended student. No kidding. Was your recommendation test physical? Truthfully, it was academic. Todoroki got in through the physical. Physical? Izuku asks this. So Yeoi Rozu answers him. There are two ways of getting in on a recommendation scholarship. Acing either the academic test or the physical test. The best two from each get to join UA High's hero course. Yeah. I almost didn't make it in, but turns out the guy ahead of me rejected at the last second. Lucky me. Wait, he rejected. You mean he passed and just changed his mind. What could have caused that? Who knows? I doubt we'll see him again, whoever he was. The day comes to an end with the students all heading for their abodes. Yeoi Rozu with all her belongings together walks down the hall to wait for her ride. But as she does, her class's representative follows after with a quick kick up. Looking back at the boy, she asks, something wrong. I was going to head home, but then I remembered something. Half of his expression turned solemn. Remember when you mentioned that I was similar to Polaris? Oh, no. She did say that by mistake. It just came out when she compared the two, and yet he remembered. Who is Polaris? Then she tell him why she said that. Well, it's not that big a deal if he knows. Plus, it'd be nice to converse with Midoriya, if they're going to be representatives they'll be spending a lot of time together. Where do I begin? The two reach the front door and pass through outside. As they do, Izuku asks, so, is he a hero or something? Because I've never heard of him. He's not a hero. He's a villain, she replies, surprising the boy. Polaris was a notorious villain who possesses similar, if not identical electric powers to yours. How notorious? Was he that strong? Queer. Yeoi Rozu watches him deep in thought as they walk. Why is he so curious for someone who he has never heard about, and why has he not heard of him before? Before her at the curb of the street of Yue Hai, the rich girl's limousine awaits her. She enters the vehicle and sits on fine leather. If you want, I can give you a ride home. Oh, thanks. She smiles as the teenager joins her inside with enthusiasm, and it drives off. Various sits go by the window as the girl looks out, looking over occasionally to find the green teen reading something on his phone. It's rather quiet. Until hey, Yeoi Rozu. Um. Finally, a conversation. This weekend I'm doing some training with Mineta, Shinso, and Kakura Bakugo. Would you like to join us? Oh? Yushi contemplates the decision for a few seconds. I'd be glad to join. But, will Mineta behave himself? I can't force him to do what he doesn't, he replies, his smile wiggling nervously. I can assure you that this is serious training, and I promise to help him so he doesn't get kicked out. Well, that's interesting. Why go out of his way unless he owes him something? Is he that good a person? She kind of wants to see this progress. So with exuberance, she says, I'd be delighted to. Great. Oh, here's my stop. Izuku unlocks the car and exits. Thanks for the ride. No problem, Midoriya, she says with a smile. He then closes the door and races away. The limo drives off afterward, the vice representative left in the back seat waiting for his fleeing form. He's cute, speaks her chauffeur as the woman makes a turn. Yeoi Rozu turns bright red in response, glancing up at the rear view window above to see the adult smirking at her. That's not what this is about. Of course not. That's a rude tone to take, one of her numerous jokes. Soon, the limousine comes to a stop right in front of her home. The front gate opens up, allowing the vehicle to drive down the bending road to reach the parking lot. Stepping out, Yeoi Rozu heads inside her mansion of a home, passing through the doors into the luxurious interior to reach the dining hall. Not here again. Empty, she says before climbing the steps. Amidst her ascent, she stops to look at her phone. Maybe next time I'll ask him for his number. It'd be nice to have someone to talk to. Such a thought promotes arabescence on her person in the form of a smile. And why stop there? I can get the girls too. The teenager passes by a maid. Good evening, Miss Yeoi Rozu. Good evening, she says to her, making her way left of the hall. I'll be in my room. 
Passing by another maid, the young Aoi Rozu enters her bedroom before plopping down on the quilts. She turns on the flat screen. Coming to you with breaking news. Aldera Jr. High just experienced a vicious shooting. Almost immediately, her attention is stricken as she listens to the anchorwoman. According to her, a man entered the school building, just while classes were breaking for lunch, causing a murder with a body count of 4 dead, and 16 injured. So horrible, she speaks, a hand up to her mouth as she watches. This is sickening, says a woman with cyan skin and lilac hair sitting on the screen. The caption shows her name as Chidas Kazuki, executive producer of Shueisha Publishing. To think in this day and age school shootings can still go on, and so easily. Four people, three children, and a teacher, all dead, and you know what the sad thing is. What is? All four of them had quirks, quirks which could have been capable of stopping this madman who took his own life shortly after. Had one hero been there, this could have been avoided. Heroes can't be everywhere. That's the point though. Yeoi Rozu changes the channel here. No need for that political nonsense. Wednesday. Over at UA on this dark cloudy day, Izuku can be seen running up to the school's front gate. He checks up ahead and spots Mineta on the ground. Our purple pervert groans as he lies with his face to the dirt, catching the emerald protagonist's attention. Mineta. Oh, Midoriya Mineta turns around to glance at Izuku. I hate you. What for? The training, he shouts. Who the hell runs with a tire strapped to their waist? My legs want to kill me with every little step I take. It's like that song. Obscure reference aside, Izuku scratches the side of his head with sheepish guilt. It is his fault after all. Why didn't you tell me you didn't want to do it? Like I could say no. I still need the training. Plus, I wanted to show off for Yaoi Rozu he plops down smiling at that, with absolutely no regret. Have you been doing the running in the morning? Mineta nods his head. Sighing, Izuku looks down at his friend. He shrugs before stretching his hand down, lifting the boy to be carried like a ball on his side. Don't worry, some icy hot will dull the pain. She's gonna see me differently, if I look good. I doubt she's that kind of person, says the electric teen as he walks. And, it's none of my business, but you shouldn't care about what's on the outside so much. But everyone only cares about what they see, is the purple boy's reply. How many times do people piss at you for telling, and not showing? Because they'd rather see something than hear it. That's not the same thing. From afar, Azawa watches with a half-smile as he enters the school building. He heads inside of his classroom for 1A, where he finds something on the front desk. He picks up a note attached to it. Wear this. Later at 12.30, the class comes together after eating. Azawa stands before his homeroom class, saying, Now for today's basic hero training. This will be a special one, so I expect your A-game. Special. Dryly, the erasing hero speaks, to prepare you for disaster reliefs like fires, floods, and earthquakes, this training will be the rescue training I mentioned before. Oh, good. Ajiro pats his desk with a grin. Finally, a time to do what makes us heroes. I'll fit in a flood scenario, says Asui in her usual tone. Azawa makes a red glare, his hair flaring up as he speaks. Still talking. The students freeze up at their teacher's cold words. He then takes out a remote, deactivating his quirk. One push is enough to unlock the cabinets holding their costume cases. If you want to take your costumes that's fine. Some of your uniforms aren't suitable for this type of training. Also, the area is remote, so we'll go by bus. After dressing up for the job, the 20 students head out guided by their class representatives. Once the bus arrives, everyone slides inside as they head for their latest destination. Things slow down a bit, so Siro begins shiratori with his classmates or at least some of them. Monkey, so why yak, says Siro, turning back to Uraka. Hey Kingfisher, she says, gesturing to Izuku. Um or so, Rhino. He turns to Yaoi Rozu. Oryx is her animal, plain and simple. All eyes are on Siro now. Oryx wait, hold up. He quickly realizes his folly. No animal starts with X. Then Midoriya should have said Rhinoceros. She closes her eyes with pride. My bad. Yes you're out, your rocket chuckles at lasting longer than him. Over in the back, Bakugo sits well staring out the window. He mutters, what the hell is an oryx anyway? It's a kind of antelope. The walking nuke's answer comes from Todoroki from the other end of the back. Hey. Who said you could eavesdrop on me? It's not eavesdropping if you say it that loud. You can't whisper. No, but you can mind your own business. I'm starting to wonder why an attitude problem like yourself is still here. Murderous eyes lay upon the ice maker, who remains calm even here. Shinso, seated right next to Ishido, chuckles before delivering his two cents. Everyone has their quirks and annoying traits, but yours could very well land you a lawsuit. Be a shame for the most popular hero to get sued for yelling at the people he was rescuing. All of you, Shu the coughing spell takes over here, and Jiru sitting next to him moves aside. 
He may not be that popular. This time, Asui speaks up. He has a powerful quirk, but so does Endeavor. Todoroki twitches here, and not many enjoy him, solely because of his personality. Nah, Shinso leans into the frog girl next to Izuku. What's your opinion on me? Umming comes from her closed lips. Your quirk reminds me of All Might. As the hairs on his head stand up, Shinso sits back in his seat with an otherwise unreadable expression. Duly noted. But just that. Strength is important, but heroes need appeal, and that sarcasm of yours is unbecoming. Izuku nods after she finishes, agreeing with her analysis. Is it any worse than Kakin's cathartic responses? Don't call me that. Or Todoroki's nihilism. Don't get me involved. Nobody likes sarcasm, is her final reply. Soon the bus arrives at their destination. Everyone steps out to what looks to be Universal Studios Japan Edition. The students make their way up the steps and into the building. Inside there are many types of areas in this location. A flood zone, a landslide zone, and a conflagration zone, as well as a collapsed building zone among others. Within the building stands a man in an astronaut suit. The former hero tells the class, welcome to USJ, the unforeseen simulation joint, before gesturing to the other person. Hey look, it's the space hero 13. Says Izuku, his excitement in plain view on his sleeve. Yuraka shakes with joy at seeing the spaceman. Before we begin, allow me to make a few points 13 begins. As many of you are well aware I'm sure, my quirk is called black hole. It sucks up and tears anything apart. Gravity girl nods rapidly. But, while I use it to save people from disasters, you have to understand that my power could easily kill someone. The classes remain silent at the serious tone being displayed. He continues, I'm sure there are some of you who are aware that your abilities are enough to kill others. Also, careless use of a quirk can kill the user too. That is why we have laws restricting quirks heavily. There are times where its fragility is brought up, but it's still a stable system. It just takes one wrong move for one uncontrollable person to take a life, and that's where we come to UA and the tests you've taken before this. The Zawa's fitness test showed you the hidden potential of your quirks and how you can use them differently. Valiant's battle training allowed you to experience the danger that your respective quirks can pose to others. My training will show you a new perspective on your quirks and how they can save lives, and by the end of the day realize that as heroes your powers can help more than hurt people. There are at least three different types of heroes, and if fighting villains isn't your forte, this could be it. That is why you are here, to learn how to be a hero. That is all. Thank you for listening. The class clap as he finishes, agreeing with his reasoning. So beautiful. Truly a heroic speech, says Iida with his hands clasped together. He's always on isn't he? Sato mutters, with Tokoyami nodding. Hendo leans over to Izuku, asking, is he your problem child? Not at all. He's just passionate. Azawa takes a look further in, narrowing his eyes. He approaches 13 asking, where is he? He whispers the answer, and the erasing hero nods with a sigh. Let's go then. He stands before the 20 students. Each of you will be divided into one of these separate locations. Your objectives will be demonstrated there. That's a deep hole. Shinso says as he looks down the side of a cliff they're on. He and the rest of class 1 are with the astronaut hero 13 on this cliff to begin their training. As many gapes in awe at the bottom that they cannot see at all, the only adult around begins with his explanation. Here's how this training will go. The situation has three students at the bottom of the chasm. Thirteen points down the hole. One is unconscious, one has an injured leg, and the last will be panicking. The duty of those up here will be to rescue them as safely as possible. But how do you expect us to get down? Kirishima asks as she glances down, using her hand as faux visors. It looks eight seconds deep. Eight seconds deep repeats Bakugo with mild annoyance. That's how long it'd take something to fall from up here. And you use a real number? She's right though, speaks Hagaker with mild worry in her voice. How are we gonna get down? It's possible if you can fly, Izuku says nonchalantly. The others stare with a pout realizing who he's referring to. What? Yeah, because everyone can do that, retorts Shinso. I don't even think voices can travel from down there. What are you saying? Shouts Iida before he runs to the side of the cliff. It's all a matter of how much you want to shout. Quite. Iraraka smiles while rapidly punching the air. Yua. This will be great. I'm perfect for this situation. Let's do it, Deku. Of course, he's off put by her exuberance. Why are you dancing like that? And so close to me? Calming down, the electric team clenches his fists and smirks when he puts himself into this thought pattern. My quirk is great for this test too. Now then, the injured for this training shall be chosen at random 13 points to Izuku, Yuraka, and Iida. You three will do. Eyes blank and surprised, they can only remark internally, how is this at random? Left with no choice, Izuku brings himself and his two classmates down to the bottom. 
There, Iida is left calling out in panic, Izuku is the one unconscious, and Yuraka has the broken leg. All that's left is to wait. Why am I the one with the broken leg? Because if you're unconscious you can't be moving, Izuku replies, and taking into account how she's busy guffawing, while Iida screams for help so earnestly, Rita's too seriously, this is the better choice. Up above, Azawa gets a look down below before turning to the others. Alright, you four will rescue the three below, he says to Yaoirozu, Todoroki, Tokoyami, and Bakugo. You can use your quirks or the objects to your right. He gestures to the items on the side, which consists of wire, a harness, and a rescue seat to place the unconscious in. Now, get to it. Todoroki walks over to the edge as soon as they're set free, staring down at the chasm below. From there he can hear Iida calling for help like a desperate child. This is nonsense. I have a quicker way of doing this. Bakugo shouts before he clenches his right hand, sparks coming out per his emotions. We'll blow up part of the mountain to let us reach them more easily. What? Yayoi Rozu is against this. Then again, anyone would. Are you insane? On the sidelines, Shinso simply gives him the exact look one would deliver to someone he's looking down on. He's like a shonen protagonist from a demon baby manga. The blonde turns to him at that, eyes ready to explode. The fucks that mean. Their raw instincts are all you got. Ha. The ice maker shakes his head with disapproval, looking away to the girl in the ruby leotard. Yayoi Rozu, make a pulley. We can use that to pull them up. Let's start with the ones who are injured. Tokoyami will go down, Bakugo, Yayoi Rozu, and I will pull. Wait, hold up, Bakugo storms before the ice user, already in a blistering fury. Where do you get off telling people what to do? It's the most effective way, a well thought out plan unlike yours, is his response. An added sentence with his cold tone is drawn in afterward. I have more important things to do than waste any more time on this training than I have to. Taken off guard by his tone, Yayoi Rozu shakes her head at this appalling scene. Both of you, knock it off. She speaks, gathering their attention immediately. How can you go starting a fight in the middle of training? Besides, isn't there something you gotta do first before we rescue them? Her boots kick to the side of the cliff as she makes a bend over to shout, everyone, please remain calm. We'll rescue you, as soon as possible. Thank you so much. Iida shouts. Whipping her head back to the students at her level, she tells them, you have to soothe their hearts and make them see that help is coming, or else saving them will only be more difficult. If you can't do that properly, you're already wasting time training. All of the watching classmates go in awe at the sight of their vice rep lecturing and reprimanding them so easily. Hiroshima cups her chin with a nod. She's so right too. Much better than I thought, adds Shinzo. I never would have even though to reassure them. But they're set up ready, Tokoyami goes down on the pulley with a tray. He drops down once reaching the bottom and examines the students as the injured. Yuraka is on the ground holding her leg, and for some reason her mouth, Iida is panicking, and Izuku is lying unconscious. Sorry to keep you waiting, he speaks. Midoriya, don't worry. We are going to be okay. Iida tells the boy, the sole female among them unable to contain her laughter. The birdman steps back a good distance before saying, we'll take Midoriya first since he's unconscious. Here, Yuraka has to ask, but how? If Deku's unconscious, it's too dangerous for two people to move him alone, and we're injured so we can't move. Correction, only one of you is injured. But, Todoroki sent me down for a reason. From his cloak rises the massive flow of the darkness living within the depths of Tokoyami's body, a bird demon if you will. I'm a two-in-one hero. Dark Shadow, move him in place. Don't give me orders, says the shadow, before he reluctantly does so. With Izuku in place, the darkness slowly raises the boy until reaching the light. From there the others take care of pulling him. Up top, Izuku is placed safely face up, like an open casket. Whispers of, I'm unconscious, comes from his lips as his rescuees help him up. Thank you, heroes. Echoes of these words, come from down below. No need to ask who. Elsewhere. Over in the Midoriya household, Inko swipes a rag against a fine glass counter table. Hums of a whimsical tune come from her lips while she proceeds to be a housemaker. The woman finishes her work before going to the kitchen. And next she pulls a spray bottle to her hand and turns to face the living room. Good afternoon. The bottle drops as she comes face to face with her guest. The electric mother faces this intruder and scuffs. With utter annoyance, she says, of course you'd come here. I won't stay long. He walks into the living room and takes a seat on the couch. He stares at the glass table and mutters, you missed a spot. Golden sparks release from fingertips as she stares him down. I'm not going back and I told him to stay away from me and my family. She jabs her finger forward, the energy growing larger around her body. That includes you too. Her bracelet beeps yellow, and soon the energy reverts inside of her. Her yellow-eyed guest laughs before saying, don't worry, I'm not here to bring you back. 
I just wanted to give you some acquired reading. He drops an item on top of her table, tapping his wispy fingers on the cover. Inko stretches her hand over and pulls the book into her hands. Seeing it, her eyes widen in horror. This is. I'm sure you love this. Have a good day. She glances back at the table, and he's gone. Nothing but his body imprint on the couch and wisps of shadows as proof of his appearance. Sparks erupt once more, igniting the autobiography before she then tosses it into the sink. Hisashi, please get it. The faucet turns on and puts out the remaining embers. She then tosses what's left into the garbage. All that remains of the charred book are pieces of its cover, including Barati left on it. Back to action. Alright, good work back in the first exercise, speaks Izawa to the entire class. All of class 1 is stand before their esoteric teacher, and 13 here in the abandoned city version of USJ, a small wind blowing in their direction and getting dust in some of their eyes. Here, Asui says, this is sadly too straightforward. Well, not every day can risk expulsion, says their homeroom teacher with unbridled snark before he turns over to the city. Here, we will conduct the next part of the exercise. 13. Bacha, Azawa. The astronaut hero makes a salute, his attention to the class now. So, here's the scenario now. In this city, a villain has caused major damage before being caught, but the aftermath left many people injured. The mission is to make sure everyone was evacuated and brought to safety. Wait, speaks Ashido with a full tooth smile. She then shakes her hand saying, this is hide and seek. At the core, precisely, replies the pro hero before he continues. So, four of you will go around looking for the 16 other students. Among them, four will not make a sound, but the rest can and will. 13 then points randomly at four of them. You four will be the rescuers. They are, as expected, Izuku, Shinso, Yuraka, and Mineta. Baku. Screams Bakugo, but whatever he planned on saying is stopped for obvious reasons. Of course, Izuku gets it. I won't look for you, got it. As they speak, the littlest member among them stares with deep concentration at the two girls in his direct line of sight Asui and Ishido or pretty much their skin-tight derrieres. The river of slime oozes down the opening of his mouth as he asks, does this mean we can touch them as much as we want and not get repercussions? No matter what. Only Uraka can touch the girls, Shinso tells his other purple-headed classmate. At that, the ladies sigh relief. Thank God. Why are you happy? Mineta eyes Jiru. I wasn't gonna touch you anyway. Not surprising that he receives a stab to the face from her ear jack. After that exchange, the students take off to go into hiding. With Azawa, 13 speaks, alright, now that everyone is hidden we will begin shortly, and start. Izuku turns to the three other searchers. Alright, here's the plan. We'll split up and go looking separately, Shinso says, speaking over Izuku rudely. Sorry. I just figured that'd be for the best. Yes, the electric child pokes his fingers sheepishly, his face red as his regular sneakers. I mean, besides me searching above and teaming up with Mineta, it's pretty much splitting up to cover more ground. Wait, why am I going with you? Mineta gripes. Because then we'd be breaking Shinso's promise, is his reply. Then it's settled. We're doing Scooby-Doo. Yuraka takes off down the street. Violet sparks erupt around Shinso as he takes off. Izuku charges his saucer and stands on top of it unfolded, pulling the uncooperative grape midget with him as they go high in the sky. The poor boy turns blue the more they levitate. I get airsick easily. The two heroes in training travel overhead looking down at the buildings. Our emerald protagonist Izuku narrows his eyes noticing no one is simply hiding on top foe the roofs. Though he does spot Shinso pulling Kirishima out of the car she was hiding in. Pecking further down the road, he witnesses Yuraka lifting fake debris off of Aoyama. This is boring, mutters Mineta as he searches. Let's go find Yeoi Rapai. Sighing, Izuku resumes ignoring his compatriot's comments on his comely classmate. Luckily, just as he passes a building does the sound of a rock hitting rock reaches his eardrums from its internal echoes. Quickly does the boy turn his head facing the source of the noise, an exaggerated curve on his electric saucer to reach down made in response, as he makes a safe hover over the source of the noise. Locked on one of the cracks leading his side in, Izuku says, Mineta, hop off and check if someone's in there. Why me? Because you're small enough to fit. A healthy observation that draws tears. Oh, you had to go there. Mineta, just go down there. It's not like there are monsters here. Reluctance flies out the window as Mineta is lowered into the ground through the use of Izuku's electromagnetic quirk, diving into the hole. The luster spark surrounding him illuminates the darkness, allowing him to stare ahead at him. Lying in the dirt face down with a splash of his blood spread down his face is Ajiro. Yua. Midoriya. He shouts, causing Izuku to jump off and land just on top of the building. It's Ajiro. He's hurt real bad. Ajiro. Izuku fires a bolt and blasts an opening big enough for him. 
what could have happened. He jumps down drawing his saucer in from above to drop onto and soften his landing. With a ray of light from his electric quirk on his hand, he illuminates what once was due to magnetizing Mineta earlier. He then gets a stronger look at Ajiro, noticing his damaged appearance as well. The electric team kneels before his tailed classmate and nudges him, sighing when he gets a pulse out of him. Ajiro is even coming around. He's okay. Oh good, Mineta says, wiping his head off the accumulated perspiration. Laughter follows after. What was I thinking freaking out? He probably just slipped and fell, and here I thought we were in danger. As if irony just came back from taking a nap, a figure slams into the side of Izuku's head. He falls to the left onto the rubble, his hands still brightening the room. His classmate turns around just as he hits the ground, shocked. Midoriya shouts Mineta as he turns around and faces him. But just before he could go and get to his side, the little one looks up in horror at their new guest. He is a tall person wrapped in heavy gray armor. His chest armor holds the UA symbol on the chest in white and black with mesh underneath seen where the arm, shoulder, hand, knee, and leg pads are. His footwear is a pair of boots. He also wields in his left hand a metal staff with a reverse rifle handle. Who the hell are you? Shouts the boy seeing the newcomer who just attacked Izuku. The fear and panic in his eyes are clear. The armored man grips his weapon, saying, I've waited so long to have this opportunity to be able to show just how foolish that guy is. He grips the reverse handle and aims at Mineta, his hold uneven. Wait, calm down. This is rescue training. It's probably all a shot is fired and a large hole is made just behind the minuscule person narrowly missing his ear. Blue spreads across his face. It's real. I'll take you out by myself and prove he was wrong. Yar no hero racerhead. Mineta turns over to where Ajiro is resting and then back to where Izuku is. Midoriya could die. Ajiro could die. I got his life flashes before his eyes as the barrel is aimed at his face. Among those thoughts, he recognizes the time he pretended to drop his pencil and pick it up to peek under skirts, the first time he got rejected by someone, and the first day of training he underwent with Izuku. You can do it, Mineta. You're sickeningly nice, Midoriya. These are his thoughts before Mineta makes a cartwheel and dodges the sloppy shot aimed at him. Once upright he throws a pop off at the barrel port, clogging it. Hari. He looks at his weapon and grabs the ball. To his misfortune, he is unable to pull it free and is now stuck to it. What the hell's this? Speak proper Japanese, you slurry machine. Mineta throws more of his grape balls at the guy, taking him by surprise and causing him to fall over. Now he's stuck sitting down. Annoyed, the man aims regardless. Shat. I'll just shoot you from here. Just before he could squeeze the trigger, a heavy impact strikes the guy in the face. It hits so hard his helmet goes flying off, the gear clanking against the ground several times. The attacker's feet plant firmly into the ground before Ani accompanies them. Our hero at this moment is revealed to be Ajiro. Ajiro? Hey. Thanks for giving me time to recover, he says, holding a hand to his head still bruised from the blunt trauma. The white martial artist then turns down to Izuku, shocked to see he was struck too. Midoriya. He goes over to him. You contain that guy. Got it. Mineta uses his balls to pin his arms and legs together. While doing so he gets a good look at his face and gasps. This guy he's just a kid, no older than we are. Ajiro shifts Izuku up, checking his pulse and breathing. Good, still alive. Despite this he's highly unresponsive, blood leaking out from where he was struck in the head. Ugh. The electric teen eventually utters a groan. His eyes open up slowly as he comes around. What happened now? Pain urges his hand to his wounded head as he sits up. Why am I bleeding? Looks like a villain attack was mixed in with our training, Ajiro says looking at the guy who attacked them. That doesn't make sense though. Mineta shouts. That was a real gun he used. If it was part of an act we shouldn't have gotten hurt. Can you honestly say he wouldn't do that? Asks Ajiro with a half scowl. Izuku remains silent while taking in what transpired. He takes out a rag from his utility belt and holds it against where he's leaking. Let's go tell Izawa. Using his saucer, Izuku levitates himself, Mineta, and Ajiro out of the building. He magnetizes the unconscious villain and carries him away with them as they make their way to their teachers. The erasing hero can be found with 13 standing amid the destroyed town. Looming his side around, 13 asks, how do you think they're doing? We'll see is his partner in crime's hollow answer. A sideways glance allows him to spot the flying heroes in training with their captive. Huh. Looks like they caught a big one that wasn't supposed to be there. The two adults approach the trio as they descend. Their prisoner of war is placed down softly on the ground. Once the saucer hits the ground they dismount, Izuku walking over to Izawa asking, Sensei, were there any additions to the training that you didn't mention? Does that have anything to do with why you found someone else? 
That is exactly why we found the someone else, is Mineta's answer. We found him in this building, after he knocked out Ajiro. His yellow finger points at the guy. He struck Midoriya, and tried to put a hole in my hand this big. Hands moved to emphasize. The villain snuck in. Azawa quickly speaks, taking a knee before the attacker. How heinous. His 13's response, hands to the face. Wait, so it wasn't part of the training? Asks Ajiro, his face showing immense terror now. Azawa glares back at the white martial artist. Why would I throw in an obstacle before you've understood and gotten used to the basics of the exercise? That's completely stupid and illogical, not to mention a huge waste of time. The adult then gets a good look at him, eyes widening at the sight of the unconscious young villain. Mandarorian. Boo. He used to be a hero core student here from last year, Azawa begins, pulling on his scarf. But, when I had expelled his entire class he was one of the halves who didn't come back, so he applied under the support course. Come back? Asks Izuku curiously. So why was he trying to kill us? Shouts Mineta with his arms stretched out, flailing about like a cheaply made animation. Thirteen raises a finger to speak. Support core students have different itineraries than everyone else. They build items to support heroes and perform maintenance on the school's pieces of equipment. The Sophomores are allowed permission to fix the systems here. They think someone would plan a revenge that would never come about. The Zawa checks Mandaro's eyes. Midoriya, can you make a light? Uh, sure. Izuku uses a finger to form a flashlight, following the adult's direction to shine it in the unconscious teen's eyes. No reaction he's drugged. Azawa then checks his mouth and notes something of interest. He did sound a bit sluggish. Azawa then stands up, taking out a whistle and blowing it loud enough to echo throughout the entire unforeseen simulation joint. There's more going on here. Someone must have been backing him. 13, once all the students get here I want you to guide them outside into the bus. Got it. Once we're all here I'm calling the principal and... Bang. The loud, familiar noise reverberates through the eardrums of all parties present. Red spots shoot out from Azawa's chest as he's flung backward, his eyes open wide. All of the others watch as he goes down, hitting the ground with a dreadful thud. Eraser Sensei. Izuku watches in horror as his teacher lies there bleeding, the others going down quickly to his side nervous and or panicky. He traces the path of where he was shot, inside one of the buildings through a crack in the broken glass. There he sees it, a glimmer reflecting off the light of USJ. He also spots black wisps. Hey. Charging his arm with green lightning, Izuku fires a bolt at the building while running in that direction, his face contorted in rage. The lightning blows a hole open big enough for the likes of death arms to walk through. He steps in through the smoke, his hand making sparks to fire at whoever attempted to murder his teacher. Sadly, there is nothing but the fading black wisps of what he saw before. Where is the shooter? In the background, he hears the footsteps and explosions of his classmates approaching as he steps forward, his foot brushing up against something metal. He looks down and magnetizes the item to lift it. It is a Remington Model 700 rifle. Let's review the situation. On Wednesday, the 24th of April, two men attacked the students of Class 1A over at USJ between 2 to 3 p.m. One is a Class 3H student, last name Rian, first name Mandaru. His accomplice is as of yet unknown, but left behind a weapon, it's a rifle of the Remington 700 model, beige and black. Their target, Class 1A's homeroom teacher Shouda Azawa. And these are all the facts. As so far we know, of course. Over in the boardroom of UA High, the teachers are gathered at a round table discussing the school shooting that took place two days ago. Among them are famous heroes. The Principal Nezu, Vlad King, Valiant, Snipe, Power Loader, Hound Dog, 13, and Midnight. Also are detectives Tsukauchi and Midoriya. The Remington's such an old model for a weapon to be used in assassination, says Snipe as he looks over the item in use. They don't make these anymore, it must have come out of a private collection. What's the situation with Azawa? asks Midnight glancing at the principal. Currently in the medical ward, is his response with a hand raised. He looks rather callous about it. Luckily, he was wearing a special vest beforehand that took most of the damage. The vest? Valiant asks as he faces the animal principal. He told us he found that in his classroom with his name tag. The others look among themselves thinking about how such a convenient item was left for him. Makes you think there's more going on than we know, Snipe adds. Doesn't matter. Hound Dog snarls, pounding his fist into the table and causing it to almost tilt. To think all those times Rian went to visit me, he faked any positiveness. I'm so ashamed. Don't beat yourself up, so much over it, speaks Power Loader, his tone also is depressed. I'm just as at fault for being his teacher and not noticing. Let's not well on what might have been, everyone, is what Vlad King says to grasp the room's attention. We have to focus on the matter at hand and find Rian's accomplice. How right you are Kansas. The principal faces the detectives. 13. 
Unfortunately, says the space hero, shuffling his suit, I checked the security cameras before and after the incident and found no one aside from Rian entering the facility. Whoever helped him didn't want to be known. Tsukauchi steps forward pushing up a piece of paper in his notes. We don't know exactly who either, but eyewitness testimony is all we have. One is Uku Midoriya mentioned seeing black wisps in the area where the sniper situated himself. Wisps Midnight cups her chin, her eyes digging into her mind through the corners of her sockets. It'll be easier when you take into account the motive to murder Azawa. Nezu taps his claw onto the table. Well it's easy to see why our student was involved, there's no way he could have gotten close unless he accepted outside support. Rianne wanted payback for being kicked out of the hero course, and while there are hundreds of villains who could take advantage of that, not many would be smart enough to keep quiet of their appearance and still almost kill Azawa. He even had the gall to drug Rianne, so he never is fingered. Tsukauchi takes in his notes, giving a look over to Hisashi with a serious expression, as he looks to be internally decoding everything. We'll continue to look into this individual, whoever it may be. We hope you all help us out. With that, the officers make their exit. Tsukauchi gives a glance to Valiant before following Hisashi. The father of one takes a look back at his partner, saying, I'm going to need some time to myself, a bit. Mmm. Hisashi heads to his vehicle and drives off, putting away the beacon that would signify he's a cop on duty. While driving, Hisashi looks at his notebook left casually in the passenger seat. Looks like you were right again, Inko. Later that afternoon. Over at the Midoriya residence, Izuku can be found with his arm stretched upward while in the living room. An electrical aura emits from his fingers as green as his hair and eyes, the latter of which is also glowing. Electricity sparks before he fires a bolt at a target sign moving across the air. And misses hitting the wall and leaving scorch on the flower pattern. Oops. And that makes three. Inko raises a finger, pointing at the wall behind her showing the same burn marks. Well, one is bigger and the other is just a hole. Sorry, mom. Izuku raises his hand to continue. Before his next failure, the front door opens up. Both mother and son look over to see Hisashi coming inside. Dad. Welcome back, Hisashi Inko pauses seeing her husband giving her a very serious look as he pulls off his hat. Did everything go okay? He was there. Confused at first, Inko soon looks silent. Solemn. Serious. I see the two turn to Izuku, still by himself in confusion. Izuku, go to your room for a minute. Huh? Thus go, Hisashi tells him, the boy going back to his bedroom with a mild annoyance in his expression. Inside his room the boy sits, lying back on his bed. The mind wanders as he does. What exactly are they talking about? Well, he could spy on their conversation, all it takes is a trash can that is in the kitchen. No. I shouldn't be spying on my parents. Using a single finger he zaps his computer turning it on. Once the screen is on he manipulates it to show news. It's like I said before, speaks Chittis on screen, we need to put an end to these shootings. At first, they were children, and now they're adults. Next. He pauses the video and moves on to another video. As he watches, eventually he hears his name. He cuts off the screen before walking into the living room where his parents await. His mother pats the couch, gesturing him over. He quietly takes a seat. So, first, Inko begins, placing a hand on her child's lap, how have you been taking this? It's I've been fine, he replies with awkward honesty. He can say that has been true for the most part, when it happened he reacted in rage and blasted the building to attack whoever shot Izawa, but for the few hours after he's been rather upset. Not just for failing to catch a criminal, but because of how close that bullet has been to his body. Just a few inches away, and he could have taken that bullet. It's okay if you feel scared, says Hisashi next to him. Dad, it's okay. I mean, this is something we deal with when you become a hero. I bet this happens to you all the tea here he stops, unable to finish that. Well that's true, that's a hard reality to take in. That's true, Izuku. I do. Hisashi pats his son's shoulder. Just understand that it's okay to feel scared. That doesn't mean you're helpless. Taking a deep breath, Izuku slowly forms a smile for his old man. Thanks, dad, mom. Good. Their hands removed from Izuku's person. Is that all you wanted to talk about? His father faces Inko, nodding to her. Taking that cue, Inko extends her right hand. From it, she draws forth a small box from the counter table and catches it. Izuku, you're going to take part in the sports festival that's going to happen, correct? They're still doing that. His eyes shooting open, he continues with, after what happened. What about Izawa sensei? Recovering, but okay. Izuku sighs out of relief. Well, I do have plans for entering. Inko groans through her closed face. I didn't want you to, but if you do then I need to tell you the truth. She taps the device attached to her wrist. I know you've been listening to us talk about this thing. Seeing the flinch he makes, she follows up. 
what did you hear about it? The that stumbling, Izuku breathes to catch himself. He didn't expect to talk about this already. I didn't hear much. Just that it drains something, and you need another or else you'll be taken away. And it grows in his eyes as he faces her. Mom, what does that mean? Who's gonna take you away? It's hard to say outright why, so I'll start from the beginning. This energy sap device, the person who shot your teacher today, and your powers all originate from this person. Looking back at his father, Izuku feels his old man tensing up. Now he's worried. What sealed can did he just ask for them to open up? It was a time after the illuminating child was born. Quirks were appearing in people, and then came the problems, some people had quirks, and were hated by the world, people who didn't, who hated them, and people who had quirks thinking they were invincible. It was chaos. But something he was aware of, those history classes taught more than they did. In the midst of it, he appeared, he was a man who took advantage of it using his quirk. It allowed him to steal quirks, and give them to others. He called it all for one. All for one? Izuku repeats, finding the first part of the name familiar. But this power, he stole from whoever he wanted, and gave them to those who supported him, giving him incredible influence in the shadows. For years his power allowed him to rule the underworld of Japan, until 24 years ago when he was killed. Killed. The way she words it makes it seem personal to her. That, and he can hear her voice breaking. In the battle against a hero Nanashimura, she and her successor All Might fought and killed him at the cost of her life. Now that catches his ears. All Might. But, he didn't. It was before his debut, his dad adds. For a time, all for one's legacy and reign of terror ended until your mother's debut. Debut? His mom made a debut? What do you, you were a hero? A villain? A villain? What? Mom, you're a villain. Eyes on her wide enough to see through the Gordian knot, Izuku can't see for certain that it's true. The shame in her eyes that he's picked up before has told him all he needs to. It was six years after that man's death, I donned armor, caused havoc, and panic, and sent heroes into the hospital. For days people feared me as the most powerful villain, Polaris. There. That has done it. His world starts to come crashing down. While he was rather upset to find out his mom was a villain, this just destroys a few foundations of the opinions of his mother. Even more, this also connects back to what Yayoi Rozu told him before USJ. But did you kill anyone? No. He breathes out relief. I only sought out All Might to murder him almost succeeded too. What? He almost falls out of his seat. His mom almost killed All Might was she that strong, you almost is that why? That's not for me to say, is her reply. The only reason I was able to enjoy the life I have now is because of the deal I made with the chief of police, thanks to your father, and All Might. This bracelet is designed to sap the electrical aura I produce and disperse it, so I do not release a signal to be tracked or use my powers for things other than lifting small objects to me, and for this entire time I've been living as Hisashi's wife, raising our only child. Perplexing is his situation. Izuku can't help but find himself amazed and traumatized by everything he's learned. But, there are things that he needs to know. Mom, there's so much I need to know. I keep a record of every fight All Might's been in, and every villain he's fought, how come I've never heard of Polaris until Yayoi Rozu brought it up? Maybe he said more than he should have, because sweat is starting to come down her face. Yayoi Rozu? Do you know her? No. That's a lie he feels. But, the reason you don't know, is that there's no information about me. You can't file info on someone, if they erase it, and modern jammers are flawless. Since I can power any device I can just have it on me, and no one can record me. But, the people who did call you a guy. My outfit masked my appearance and voice. If everyone was looking for a guy, no one would check for me. She looks rather whimsical with that and I'm logic. The point is, no one would know about Polaris unless they were there, his dad tells him. I guess, but, what does that have to do with Wednesday? Hisashi turns to Inko. After your description of what you found, your father and I have an idea of who was behind it. He digs into his coat pocket and pulls out a burnt book cover. Arati? He says, looking at the remains of the cover. Wasn't that the restaurant from One Piece? Metal Liberation Army. Hisashi gives his son the cover. Someone came and visited your mother while you were away at school and left this little clue for us. His quirk to disappear had the same wisp effect you described to your teachers. But it did. The two nod to their son. And what's the Metal Liberation Army? Inko crosses her arms together with narrow eyes. They are, in short, a secret cult of villains who hate the regulations put up on quirks. The army was once active back when those regulations were being made and disappeared after their leader Destro died. An army of villains. He shouts, shocked by the idea of that many villains capable of taking action and destroying society. 
When All for One died, they started a resurgence gathering funds and resources to attempt to take action one day. Attacking Eraserhead was then making the first move since his quirk can stop anyone else's and its unique being so easily used. With all the information his father brings, a layer of wise is being answered for Izuku. They use that senior's hatred for Azawa to unsuccessfully kill him. Finding himself with one last question, he asks, is it okay for you to tell me this? We kind of have to because your life is in danger too. It feels like this whole several minute meat has been a clustering pile of crystal surprises. I'm in danger. No one else has the power that rivals the scale as that man's, except for All Might, and the MLA wants that on their side, she tells her son, her golden aura crackling from her hand. Whether your power is my scale or not, once the whole world sees your quirk, those who know of my quirk will put two and two together and see the second coming of Polaris. Now that's something to think about. The sports festival will expose his quirk to an entire nation, and those MLA villains are watching. Everyone he knows will too how would his friends feel if they found out. How would Yayoi Rozu and Yuraka see him? Why are they the first people he thought of? So with that in mind, are you still going to become a hero? Hesitant, Izuku keeps her words in his head as he thinks about what to do. Does he still even want to be a hero after all this information? Yes. Answering himself and his mom, he keeps a resolute face with his decision. Dad said to me before that being a hero means striving to become stronger to protect others. Would you remove that to protect me and dad? Without hesitation is her quick response. Then I'll just get stronger to protect you and dad and where else can I be than the best hero school in Japan? His dad crosses his arms now. What am I, a charity case, says Hisashi, causing the mother and son to laugh. He then smirks. It's my job to protect you too, as both a police officer and the man of the house. Besides, he eyes Inko, I was the first person to touch her. Only because I didn't know you were a dragon, is her response. And they laugh after that. Elsewhere. Itashi approaches a lavender home on the outskirts of the city. He knocks on the door and stands there waiting, holding a bag in one hand. Alright, just stay calm. Do not make yourself look stupid. And. The door opens up and all of his planning goes out the window. A brown-haired beauty peers her head out the door and presents to him a warm expression. His face turns bright red while looking at her. Oh, Shinso. You finally made it. Hello ma'am she takes his hand, smiling now, and brings him inside with a pull. As the older woman guides the purple-haired student into the peaceful interior, his eyes spot a funeral display off in the corner, two pictures on the top. I'm glad that you came over. Tashi was just by. I bet he was, is his response before they enter the kitchen. Here are some things mom wanted me to give you. Why, thank you. Receiving the bag, the Shimura mother goes through the bag and sorts out what amounts to groceries. Would you like to stay for dinner? Tenko should be over soon. Against my better judgment as delicious as her meals are, he has an important quota to reach today. But why not? Friday. Two days have gone by since the events of USJ. As it was Tuesday, the students are brought back on the last school day of the month. Bright and early this day, the main door to the building opens up. Inside the building steps the green-haired representative of Class 1A, going into the room where the rest of his classmates are. Most of them are already talking amongst themselves about what they did over the weekend. Of course, once he steps in he becomes the center of attention. Midoriya. Iida says as he steps forward. How is your head injury? Oh, uh, just fine. He pats his head where the blow he suffered was. After it closed up he completely forgot about it. The wound's gone, and there's no scarring, thankfully. Mineta examines his head, forcibly prying his hair to view where he was struck. My word. It's only been two days, such injuries shouldn't disappear that quickly. Really? It's not that uncommon for me. Pulling free of Mineta, Izuku returns to the front of the class where Yayoi Rozu stands. Midoriya, good to see you've also returned. I was worried. He gives her a questionable look. Why wouldn't I? Many of us have mentioned that their parents feel unsafe putting us back into school, including mine. He can agree to that. It's not every day the greatest hero establishment in Japan has an assassin break in and attack a teacher. We're here now, so no need to worry. I'm just wondering who's going to replace Azawa since he's hospitalized. At that moment, the door opens up. Don't look down on me, Midoriya, says Azawa as he steps into the room. Sensei. The class representatives walk back in a hurry to their seats with his arrival, glaring at the hero recovered. I can't believe you're actually back. It's not a big deal. Besides, it'd be irrational of me to believe I can remain convalescent when you lot can't even quiet yourselves in less than 10 seconds. He's got us there, Mineta agrees. Izuku nods. That's true, Kirishima adds, the redhead crossing her arms over her chest, besides, he was only injured, not sick. No need to convalesce for that. 
It's the same thing, Shinso says back to her. When you recover your health from something over a while that's convalescence. It applies to injuries, surgeries, and illnesses. That's not what Google says. She replies. Then what's the word for recovering from an injury that doesn't apply for illnesses? His question is met with silence. See? Hiroshima slaps her head with both hands, forcing her face into the desk. I gotta learn Japanese again. Quickly, all students are silenced at the sight of their teacher glaring his crimson eyes at them with his hair flaring up. These features fade after silence is established. This is exactly what I was talking about. He sighs before getting back his posture. Now that that's out of the way, we have another issue at hand far more important than what happened on Tuesday. Eyes on him, they wait what their eclectic teacher would tell them. After what happened previously, it could be something extremely bad, there could be a super hard test, villains could have infiltrated the school again, maybe even expulsion is in the air. You must prepare for the sports festival coming up. Sighing with relief, it's still a regular school thing. Many speak out in excitement after that bit of info was released. UA's annual sports festival is the perfect way for many students to go out and expose their abilities to the world, showing all how up to snuff they are. Raising a hand, Asui asks, is it a good idea to have the festival after what happened? It could easily be a breach in security. Yes, well we are going to work on security even more, begins the teacher as he rubs his hair, we're going to continue with this. The world knows of my shooting, so the world is going to see that UA is safer than before. What better way than continuing with a major event such as this, is what we agreed upon. Besides, all of you students will have internships after this. This will be your means of making a resume, let them know what your capabilities are by going far in the festival. Pausing for a moment, Azawa takes out eye drops and hovers it upside down over his left eye. There are two weeks from now to then, and you have other priorities in between such as entertainment lessons which I'm not participating in at all, and your midterms. Once his eye is lubricated, he turns back to the class. Keep that in mind in the following weeks. Following his announcement, the rest of the day proceeds smoothly. Amidst it, Izuku writes in his notes. It shows a picture of himself with lightning surrounding him. Blurs are showing him moving fast. I don't know what Shinso's quirk is, but there seems to be an energy application involved with it. A theory I had was that he gets energy that lets him produce incredible power and makes him strong. So maybe I can use my electric energy to make me faster. He turns the page and looks upon a new picture. Huh? He doesn't remember this picture. It looks like some adult who is wearing armor colored red, black, and gold. He has a helmet on with an opening shaped like an M, but he can't see his face. He also possesses gold eyes and a flowing cape. When did I draw this? And color it. It's weird. It kind of reminds him of that dream, the one he told Shimura about. Well, that's not important right now. What is important is that he gets stronger. For his future as a hero, for the sake of others, and his mother's freedom. Thanks for watching this video. Part 2 is over. If you really enjoy this video, like subscribe and comment down below and turn on that bell notification. And also check out the playlist that I have created and enjoy. Link is in the description. See you in the next video. Goodbye.